All right. Hi, guys. I'm super excited to be here with um, Blick Art Materials. We're live and we're going to do a little demo and a Q&A session. So just um, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. But otherwise, I think we're just going to go ahead and get started. So first, I'm going to go over some materials that we're going to be using in this piece. Um, first and foremost, one of my absolute favorite, favorite, favorite papers is this Fabriano Hot Press. It is a wonderful smooth paper that works great for mixed media. Um, and the mixed medias that we're going to be using on it are these PH Martin's con concentrated watercolors. Um, they kind of work as a watercolor and also an ink. They're very vibrant, so they're great for illustration projects. We're going to be doing a wash with these guys, and then we're going to be moving for detail to these Blick Studio brush markers. Um, they're going to be great for layering on top of the PH Martins. And then for final, final details, we're going to be using one of my absolute favorite colored pencils, um, Faber-Castell Polychromos. And if we get time in the end, we only have an hour, but if we do get time in the end, there's some other really great materials that we're going to be going over as well. And I'll also be introducing a few materials like during the drawing process that are really fun and exciting for mixed media work. So I think with that being said, let's get started. All right. So I went ahead and sketched out this piece um, beforehand. So we're just going to be working with the color materials. We've got this beautiful fantasy stag here um, with some lantern details. I went ahead and did the preliminary sketch. Um, just as a note, I usually do start all of my sketches in a tinier sketchbook. Um, Moleskin tends to be my absolute favorite. And what I went ahead and did was blew this drawing up and then traced it with a light board, um, which saves some time um, in the drawing process to like get that translation correct. But if you're curious, I always start in a sketchbook and then when I'm working larger, blow it up on a larger piece of paper. All right. So, like I said, if you have any questions while I'm working, feel free to get start. Uh, feel free to ask them. Um, but otherwise, we're just going to get started. So, like I said, we're going to start uh, with the PH Martin's concentrated watercolors and some watercolor brushes. We're going to start with this big flat brush, just so we can get a lot of um, washes down, pretty broad and fast. And so I'm just going to build my palette. Um, we're going to start with some browns and some like brown greens. It's going to be a nice like lush forest color. So while I'm doing this, if you've got any questions, feel free to. Um... So we got lots of people tuning in. Hey, everyone. Um, we are so happy to have you guys in the studio with us here today. Katie is making an awesome stag. Um, I'm just going to summarize some of the materials that she introduced first. Uh, so in her sketchbook, she tends to use a mechanical pencil. Um, sometimes she'll use a drafting pencil, which is great for using a smaller lead like a 0.5. Um, for this one, she just used the regular mechanical pencil. Um, and she uses a moleskin sketchbook. It's a moleskin art sketchbook um, that has a pretty high weight paper. They do make a watercolor sketchbook, but she's not using that one for this. For the actual piece, she's doing that on Aquarelle hot press paper. And this one, what size is this one, Katie? This is a 12 by 18 paper. Um, it's a great size to work on. It's very frameable and also like nice and big. So you can get lots and lots of detail in your illustration. So right now I'm just, um, adding some washes to this, to this stag creature. Um, I'm starting with a flat brush, which is really wonderful for some of these washes. And then also to save time, I know people um, sometimes ask how much watercolor I use in my work. Um, I almost always do start with watercolor base, but to save time on drying, I tend to work with a minimal amount of water, unless I'm trying to really like spread out that media and get some of that aqueous effect. So right now I'm working pretty dry and just trying to get these base colors down. 
So we got a question coming in. What do you like most about the colored pencils that you have? Oh, that's a really wonderful question. I think too, there'll be more questions about colored pencils when we get to the colored pencil section of the drawing. Um, but the ones I'm using right now, they're again, Faber-Castell polychromos. Um, I really love these because they create just a very, very vibrant effect. Um, they're also a hard lead, um, which means they're really great for fine detail. You can sharpen them down to a very, very fine point and add detail to the end of a drawing. Um, sometimes I'll use uh, instead Prismacolor pencils. They've got a very nice waxy lead. Um, they blend really well, but since we're going to be using mostly inks and markers to start, we're just gonna go on with that fine detail of colored pencil at the end. And so Faber-Castells would be my choice for that. And since we only have an hour, I'm going to do my best to get these washes down really quick so that we can get into some of the other materials as well. So one of the other questions that we've gotten is whether you use references for your work, uh, specifically for this one. Oh yeah, that's a really wonderful question. Um, in general, I do tend to use reference images. Um, there's lots of really great stock sites that have um, images for, for use. Um, so you can like reference different animals and poses and things like that. Um, we also, Tyler and I, um, my husband who you're talking in the background, uh, we travel quite a bit and get our own reference images. So we always have a big bank that I can pick from for drawings. Um, and I tend to use a combination of reference images. Um, so it's not just copying a picture, but rather kind of using different aspects of different pictures and pulling them together, like the different um, things I like from different photos and combining them. And then for these lanterns too, I did use a few reference images to kind of combine some cool elements to create something unique in the sky's antlers. But yeah, definitely nothing wrong with using um, reference images. I would highly recommend. Just as long as you have permission. To use them. Exactly, as long as you have permission to use the images. So another great question is uh, whether you prep your paper any certain way? Um, that's a really wonderful question. Um, for the paper that I'm using right now, what I like to do is tape it down with an artist tape. So what we have here is this um, very fine white artist tape and just go along the entirety of the edge so that when you're using this wet media, it will, it will tend to buckle even if you're not using too much water. Um, but if it's stretched properly, then it will lay flat when it dries. And it also just helps in general to have that, um, that white edge, you know, peel it up at the end and it's very satisfying. Yeah, that is the most satisfying <laughs> part is watching when she does a beautiful full background and pulls up that tape and you just have this crisp line. This tape in particular is a, it's a lower tack, so you don't really need to worry about it pulling up your paper or anything like that. It really just works to mask off that area. But yeah, like I said, I think just try and work a bit quicker to get these washes down because I do want to get to some of these other really cool materials that I'd like to share with y'all. So we have a question about uh, what you're using for your palette liner. Um, in there right now is a Bristol palette liner. It's essentially just nine by 12 sheets of wax paper. And you can use anything like that. You can even just use a piece of porcelain um, Katie does these because she likes to make certain palettes. Uh, for this one, for her PH Martin, she has pulled aside about 12 different particular ink colors. And another um, note about the palettes too is um, some people stay away from the, the reusable palettes just because they can be wasteful. I've had this reusable palette for, I think, going on five years now. I don't know if um, Tyler has one of my old palettes in the background, but I'll use one of these palettes for about five months and it'll just build up color like over and over and over again. Like they look insane by the end. Um, so like I definitely don't pull out a different sheet each day. So Katie does use uh, Bristol paper. We had a question about whether this was Bristol paper. This is not, this is 
a very high weight hot press watercolor paper. The hot press technique creates a very smooth surface, very similar to smooth Bristol, um, but it takes the media a little bit different. Yeah, it accepts watercolor a little more um, favorably than Bristol board. Bristol board really does tend to buckle if you use too much water with it, which I mean, isn't to say you shouldn't use it. I use Bristol all the time, um, but you can be a little more liberal with your water use and um, build up a few more layers with them. Um, So I'm just going to put a little bit down, um, just kind of as reference for where it'll shine in the end. I like using them as highlights and then also for the light itself. So we'll be using more of those um, those pearlescent colors too a little bit later on. Sorry about any issues that may have just happened, guys. It looks like we got temporarily kicked off, um, but we are back and going now. If there was any break for you guys, um, you may have missed. Uh, Katie's using fine tech pigments, which we'll get to a little bit later in salmon use. They're just pure magic. But yeah, still just um, building up layers with them, um, with these inks. Being pretty um, liberal with how much paint is going into certain areas. And to make sure we get to all the materials that I listed at the beginning too, I think we'll switch over to the markers pretty soon so you guys can see how those look when placed on top of the, when placed on top of the pH Martins. So we had a question regarding how these watercolors differ from tube or pan watercolors. That's from June Bell. Oh, that's a really wonderful question. Um, so these watercolors specifically, and I guess I should mention this because it's an important note, they are not entirely light fast. They're great for illustrations, um, meaning like if you create the piece and then immediately scan it, they're really, really wonderful um, in that regard. But if they're placed in a frame with light over time, they will fade a little bit. They won't fade entirely, like they still look beautiful. But if you're going to use a tube watercolor such as Van Gogh um, or Windsor & Newton or something like that, those tend to be light fast and hold up a little bit better over time. And so what I like to do with these watercolors is I never use them just on their own. I always layer with um, markers and colored pencil. Um, so it really picks up those vibrant areas and ensures that they will last over time because we do like our pieces to be archival um, for collectors and our own records and things like that. So we had another question about the paper. Um, this question is what weight it is and whether it's 100% cotton. Um, oh. What we are using is Aquaro um, and currently what she's using is the hot press. It is 100% extra white cotton. So it's very, very bright white. Um, if you compare it to Bristol, it does have the slightest bit more of a warm tone, but it's a very bright white. The weight of it is 140 pounds for this particular paper. And I'll keep mentioning illustration just because that's primarily what I do, but a lot of the choices I make are with that in mind, like what will scan the best, what will create the most vibrant illustration so that when it's printed on a t-shirt or product or anywhere, it's going to have a really, really vibrant look to it, like almost sort of a digital look to it. Um, so that's why I use the extra bright white paper. So I love this question from Ann Davis. Um, will this hide the sketch lines? Um, is their question. And so 
Katie, do you remove these sketch lines after? Do you leave these on? Um, so what I do is I build up the materials. The materials themselves will hide a lot of the sketch lines, especially if the sketch lines aren't too messy. Um, sometimes if the sketch lines are too messy, what I'll actually do is I'll transfer the drawing to a different paper um, just because I don't want to deal with that, um, that mess in the end. But in the end as well, if there are any leftover sketch marks, I'll go back with one of my absolute favorite erasers. It's this um, green gum eraser. It picks up pencil very, very well. And that'll catch anything that the materials themselves don't cover. But especially when working in combination with inks and marker and colored pencil, a lot of those sketch lines tend to get hidden over the process of drawing. We're just building up this base of um, color with the with the inks. Normally, this process might take anywhere from two to five hours, depending on how big the piece is. I think what I'm going to do is switch over to the markers in just a moment and finish building up the base with the markers, just so y'all can see how the markers work with the paints. It's a really lovely combination. I'm just going to finish off these antlers really quick and I think then I'll switch over. So we have some people wondering if it would be possible for you to tell the colors that you're using um, as you go. Oh, of course. I'd be happy to. Um, right now I'm using some of my favorite um, browns. There's a coffee brown, a golden brown. Um, I'll, I'll just list them off instead of showing them. A saddle brown. And I think I have a tapestry in here as well. I really love the tapestry color from PH Martins. Um, and then as far as greens are concerned, I have an ice green and a chartreuse. There's also a jungle green and a tobacco brown, which is a brown with a bit of a green tint to it. And I think some of those like create really very lovely forest colors. And how I tend to work with these colors is you'll kind of um, notice maybe if you can see the palette, the palette is like really getting muddy pretty fast. Um, but I tend to keep the different color families separate. And as they combine together, I think they create really lovely gradients. So it's not always necessary to pick up one color at a time. You can mix and match as you go. And as long as those color families are together, it creates a really unique, lovely look in my opinion. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. <laughs> We're just going to finish off this front antler. Part of the fun with this sketch too was getting some of those fantasy elements. I really enjoyed getting these antlers to twist and turn around each other. And I think too at the end when we can see some of the light effects from the lanterns, it's gonna be really fun. Another really important point too that I don't think I've gone over yet is maybe you can see on the camera, but there's some green lines in here that I added before we started the drawing. Um, that's actually masking fluid that I added using a masking fluid pen. Um, it's gonna be really great at the end. We're gonna pull it up and it's just gonna create some very clean, crisp white lines that'll emphasize different areas of highlights and light. Um, I do tend to use a masking pen or masking fluid in a lot of my drawings, especially for areas that need to just stay bright, bright white. Almost finished with this front antler. Yeah, 
think too, what I'll do is add a few more shadows. Look at this eye here really quick. So right now I'm just using a dark brown and I'm using an angular shader. Just, I just add in a few fine details. Um, I don't like to use black until the end of a drawing for the very darkest um, darks, just because adding black can tend to make the drawing a bit muddy. Um, the only time I'll use black at the start of the drawing is if it needs to have a very graphic look to it and then I'll use a fine liner pen. For some of the outlines to get that very graphic look. So we had a question about the best way to scan in a drawing. And I know you have a very particular experience with this. I know you've tried every way possible. Yeah, it is one of those things, and I hate to say it, where you put some money in and it does create better results. I've tried a variety of scanners. I've tried um, just cheaper flatbed scanners. I've tried scanners attached to printers. I've tried pretty much every brand imaginable Canon um, HP. And what I've found is there is nothing better than an Epson artist scanner. Um, you look them up and they are very expensive. We waited a very long time before we could afford investing in one. So I would recommend if you need a quality scan of your drawing is to look in your area at local print shops. A lot of local print shops will have high quality scanners and artist scanners. And you can take your artwork in, especially if it's a larger drawing, and you can have them scan the artwork for you. Um, that's what uh, Tyler and I did for a very long time before we could invest in a better scanner. Um, now we use the Epson Artist Series scanner, and it gets Which, the colors perfectly. It's very nice for illustration. Um, I can show it off yeah. real quick. We're in our <laughs> studio, guys. Um, so it might be a little messy right now, don't judge us. Um, but this is the scanner that Katie is referring to. And it's really big. It's a very big flatbed scanner. Um, it was a very big expense, but that's what we scan everything that we make for us, for our clients. So here's Katie's studio. Here is the exact paper that she's using and the colored pencil which she's using Faber-Castell. Here's her palette. You can see the mess that she's referring to, but it's a beautiful chaos. It really is. And I do like to emphasize anyone can do art or make artwork on a budget. You don't have to invest in a super fancy scanner off the bat. I really do recommend looking into local print shops. Um, if you have a university, a lot of the times on the university's art program will have the same scanner that Tyler just showed. Um, I used our university scanner all through college. Like, there's ways to make it work. There really are. All right. I could go forever and ever and ever and ever and ever with the PH Martins, but in the interest of time, I think I'm going to go ahead and switch over to the marker just so you guys can see what the marker layer looks like. And I'm going to go ahead and pull some light browns. I think maybe let's try this walnut color. Um, and then I'm going to use this brown in tangent, I think, with a light blue. And what I'm going to do is this background antler, I'm going to make recede a bit. So I'm going to first put down a layer of this um, very, very, very light blue with the Blick Studio brush markers. And it'll look a little funny at first. Why is one of the antlers blue? <laughs> but I think you'll see once it's layered with the brown, it creates this really nice receding effect. I'm just getting these colors down really quickly. I'm using the brush tip, which is really great for control, especially in tight areas, such as these antlers. Just get this very tip 
All right, so we've got that base color down. Now, let me see if this filament works. I'm gonna get a lighter. I'm gonna pull a tan and I'm also going to pull, well, we'll try the walnut and the tan and see which one works out. I do really like that tan. And then when you use it with the blue, it creates this really rich kind of receding brown. I'm just gonna continue building up this tone in the antlers. If anyone has questions about markers or blending or anything like that, feel free to ask. And you'll kind of notice too, Tyler's got it um, really close up to the drawing. So you'll probably see like the lines are not perfect. Um, that will be fixed towards the end with the colored pencil. A lot of those like um, lines and crevices and things get touched up with the colored pencil. I'm not worrying too, too much about being 100% precise right now. And especially, like I said, in the interest of time, we're gonna build up these layers quickly. And again, I just like to mention that we did use this masking fluid. Um, it's really great. It stays down. It doesn't pull up when you use different materials over it. But then at the end, when we do pull it up, you're going to see some really fun, crisp lines, especially from the lantern glow. So we have someone asking, we have Carrie asking why the markers instead of just watercolor painters? Um, so that's a really excellent question. Um, I personally just love to work with mixed media and normally, and like I said earlier, in a normal drawing, I would have an entire layer of the um, paint layers first. Um, I'm just trying to illustrate a variety of materials as quick as possible um, for this drawing. But after I had the entire paint layer in a normal drawing, then I would go in with the, with the marker just to start to refine some detail. So like we would go into areas like this fur and like maybe take this tan and you see this brush tip creates some really very nice strokes very quickly. I can say it took her quite a while to really like master that combination. For a long time it would just be paint layers or just marker and these markers are alcohol based right? Yes these markers are alcohol based and I'm glad um, Tyler brought that up. There's a variety of different markers. You may have heard of Tombow. Um, you may have heard of Copix. You may have heard of Windsor and Newton markers. And the biggest difference between the variety of markers is whether or not they're water soluble or whether or not they're alcohol based. Alcohol based markers dry almost immediately. So you'll notice I'm putting down these layers and as soon as I put them down, I can pretty much go on top with this um, blue green color and it doesn't smear the layer underneath. Um, that's why al alcohol-based markers are great. The layers dry immediately. You can immediately layer, they're meant to be layered. If you use something like Tombow, um, they're great in a different way, but very different. They're water soluble, meaning that the layers do not dry immediately. If you use another marker on top or if you use mixed media with water, um, it will pull up that marker underneath and spread it around. Um, I can actually, just for fun, let me illustrate because why not? I've got some combos right up here. So let's pull out, we'll make this work. Let's pull out this blush color because 
our little stag friend is going to have a nice little blush colored. So these markers, this one that you're currently using is water-based. Yes, this is the water-soluble Tombow. And the ones that you were using are alcohol-based. Correct, correct. Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, now we've got some nice little pink tufts of fur. We'll go in so, with a water-drenched um, Just uh, your brush. normal paintbrush that you were using for watercolor. And you notice that Oh, it picks water it up is entirely. yeah, it picks it up entirely, and you can kind of use it exactly like watercolor. So you can go in and be super precise with your marker, like so. Some more little fur tufts, and then if you like, you can go in with that water and kind of blend it around into the drawing. So completely different effect, completely different purpose, but still an awesome marker. But that's the difference between alcohol-based and water-soluble. You'll notice if I drench my brush here in water and try and pick up these black markers, they're not going anywhere. Nothing moves. Nothing moves, exactly. You can go back with watercolor on top and not have to worry about your drawing smudging. Now, if I wanted to go back with watercolor down here, this pink would bleed completely into the water. So I know you get asked a lot whether you use watercolor pencils and the answer is no, you really don't use watercolor pencils, but it seems like you might suggest using Tombos like when you want to control. Yeah, exactly. Um, I've tried watercolor pencils and they just don't work for me personally. I know amazing artists who make watercolor pencils work. Um, I've just found that I get frustrated whenever I use them. That's not to say not to try them. Like I say, try every material possible and see what works for you. Um, but no, I do just use regular colored pencils and I tend to use them. Well, sometimes I'll do a full colored pencil drawing in which case, obviously I use it throughout the entire drawing. But otherwise, if I'm doing a mixed media drawing, I'll use the colored pencils at the end for fine detail, which is what I'll be doing on this drawing. So I'm, you know, I'm just, I guess you can see I'm just switching between materials pretty quickly here. like using different paints and different markers, depending on what kind of effect, effects I want to get. Um, like, like going through this like mossy mane effect with the watercolors. And then I might pick up this marker again and go up and try and finish up the antlers. Not usually this all over the place, or maybe I am. You are. <laughs> maybe I am. You always make it look so coordinated like an orchestra with all its parts. You have so many medias going on, they just work so well. And I do find that if you work all over the drawing simultaneously, it tends to create a cohesive look. Sometimes if you hyper-focus like on one section of the drawing and then you notice that the rest of the page is blank, it's hard to um, replicate that exact look that you just spent an hour on. Um, so that's my preference. So we have a question about the table and I can answer that one. Katie loves this table. It's from Blick. Um, this is her glass drafting table from Blick. Um, this one is a white color. It has um, a drawer that she has full of all of her drafting tools. So yeah, it's from Blick. If you need a great drafting table that will last you for years, get one from them. But yeah, I've had this table, I think, going on about five years now. And it's my favorite that I've had. It's got cool little compartments too. It's got this um, really nifty side table, which you can put up. Sometimes I'll have my palette right there. Um, brush holders, pencil holders, like just what you need. And this awesome, awesome pull-out drawer, which you can see has different materials in it right now. Um, drafting materials for sketching obviously, whatever you want in the drawer. They fit colored pencils and um, any drawing materials pretty perfectly. We have a fun question. Um, a fun question. I mean, they're all so fun. <laughs> keep the questions up, guys. We love questions. Um, but this is from Robin. It's, okay. do you find it easier to draw predators or prey? Ooh. That's fun. That is a really fun question. I think I have to go with predators um, just because I grew up drawing wolves and dragons and things. Um, but I think as far as features are concerned, maybe, um, I don't know. I don't know. They're completely different anatomy. I think whatever anatomy that you're most used to drawing, like 
you know, if you go from wolves to like big cats. Yeah, so um, they actually said like, yeah. I find it a lot easier to draw wolves and cats than deer and rabbits. Do you have any tips for improving your prey drawings? Ooh, that is a really great, great question too. And I think what I've noticed at least, if you grow up drawing things like wolves and dragons and like you mentioned, big cats, you do tend to like learn some of the um, little telltale signs of a predator. Um, their eyes tend to be lower on their head. Their muzzles tend to kind of narrow out in a certain way. It's really interesting. A lot of prey animals, and this is like one of the biggest things I notice in um, people who move from drawing predators to prey, they'll put the eyes way too low. Prey tend to have the eyes pushed back up on the face because they um, need to be able to see. Yeah, her, exactly. Right? They need to be able to have that bigger um, field of vision. So if you just kind of nudge that eye up a little higher than you think it needs to go, I think all of a sudden your wolfy deer start to look like actual deer. And that's one mistake that I made constantly up until a few years ago as well. Um, there's other little things like that, but that's just one of my favorite tips. Somebody mentioned that to me um, and it just made a world of difference. So we have a question. Do you think your markers last? Like That's another really excellent question. Um, I'm going to be completely honest. I just started using these Blick Studio markers and I love them so far. For me, they've lasted, I think, going on about two or three months now. Which you draw. Yeah, I draw every you day. You draw every day, yeah. <laughs> hours and hours, full time drawing. And so months of it is pretty astounding. But I will say, that I think a few of them are starting to um, to dry out now, not dry out, sorry, um, lose ink, which is completely normal for a marker. And they have really um, wonderful refills. And I think too, uh, it's important to mention that before I started using the Blick Studio markers, I used um, the Copic markers and I still use the Copic markers in my drawings as well. And those tend to run through ink insanely fast. And so I always carry refills um, for my Copic markers so that I don't have to constantly replace them because I'm sure, you know, if you've bought a Copic marker before, they're insanely expensive. <laughs> if you buy these refills, it's the same price of a marker and it'll last you for years. So if you're investing in a marker, I say always invest in the refill as well. You'll save a lot of money. Oh, we're, we're getting quite a bit of love for the studio. Thanks, guys. We we try. It's got to stay organized. I can't take any credit. Tyler is the organization master. Oh, come now. We have to do it around <laughs> how you work. Uh, but yeah, we, these pen holders are awesome. Um, these, you can actually get these from Blick, and they're fantastic. They let you see all of the colors. Um, before that, we had tried, you know, some DIY kind of stuff, which you can see up here. And that's just not near as nice. These trays stack really well. So you can take each tray apart if you want to pull out like just one color scheme. Um, so you can get these from Blick. They're fantastic. Uh, they're really affordable. They're really durable. And they come in two different colors. So you can personalize it to your studio. Oh, and I think what I'll do too now is I'll, I'll pull out a new material. Because um, I think that we cut out while well, I was using these fine tech paints. So I'm just going to briefly go over them again. And I apologize if you're hearing this for a second time. But these fine techs are some of my absolute favorite materials that I've been using recently. Um, I'm sure you can see it on the camera, but they have this wonderful shimmer effect. And depending on how much paint you load up on your brush, they can be applied anywhere from transparent to completely opaque. Um, they're great for light effects, for shimmer. At the end of the drawing, you can kind of like tilt the paper a bit and see how much it shimmers and glows, especially when in the sunlight or like under light. And so I'm going to use it for some of the highlights on these antlers and also in the lanterns themselves to, so they actually glow on the page. And I'm just going to pull out to, I think, a smaller round brush. Let's see. What size brush should we use? All right, so I've settled on a size six round brush. 
And we're just going to load up some of this um, fine tech paint onto the brush. And then kind of get in here pretty close. And I don't know if um, you kind of move the Osmo around if you can see that shimmer if it shows up for everyone watching. Let's see. Comment if you can see some shimmer. It's very. We'll see some more. Yeah. When it gets laid in a little bit more. It's definitely apparent in person, but sometimes on the video feed, it's hard to see. But other than being a great paint for um, kind of like more visual light effects, it's also um, really nice for like detail and just general color overlay. Yeah, the Finitec are really richly concentrated. Uh, so you can see, like, she can just add in some detail really easily. Um, and so they do have a beautiful color, even when they're not shimmering. So we'll just kind of, like, be generous so that put some fun light effects in around this lantern. And since this masking fluid is down, when I pull up the masking fluid, you're gonna see that this light effect um, has a bright streak through it, which will be really fun. And don't worry guys, I'll show off the shimmer some more in just a moment. Yeah, just using it for the actual light effects themselves and then highlights on the antlers where these lanterns might be casting their light the most. So we have a question. What we have a, a couple great questions and we'll do our best to get to all these. So to start off, what brush brand are you using? Um, right now I'm using Princeton Opera. Aqua Elite. Um, I've started using those, I think, in the last like two or three years, and they've been my go to brush. Um, just so you can see that. Um, this is a smaller round brush, it's a size six, but I also started with see, a nice flat brush for just getting down those initial washes and then an angular shader for more washes and precise like details. Like you can really get in there with that shader and get some awesome um, fur strokes. And I'll probably go back to the angular shader actually, just so I can start working down on this area. So another question that we have is, um, whether Blix sells the shimmery watercolor paints? Uh, I can answer that. Yes, they do. That's how we found them. We're always looking for cool new materials to try out. Um, and we did find these when we were just browsing our local Blick. Um, they are fine tech. Um, here I can show off the package. So this is one of their sets. They have a ton of different colors. Uh, this is the iridescent color set. And you see it's fine tech. It's just fine and then TEC. Ooh, and I might too, just really quick, if you guys are interested, um, people are always curious if the sketchbooks are good for mixed media. Um, you can see I actually use the fine tech um, for this lion drawing right here. And I don't know if you can see that shimmer, but it took the fine tech really well. And it did lay flat in the end. I just don't recommend using too much water if you're going to go mixed media, but it can take a bit of it. Yeah. If you do want to use more watercolor, Moleskine does make a watercolor specific. It's their Moleskine Art Watercolor Sketchbook. Um, and you can also find that at Blake. Blake has just about anything you need. Um, pretty much everything Katie uses in here can be found at Blake. Uh, but for that sketchbook, that's just the regular Moleskine Art Sketchbook. That's great for dry media, for controlled wet media. Um, the benefit over it is you have more pages than you would in watercolor since the watercolor paper is thicker. I also find that I don't enjoy sketching as much in the water. I mean, obviously if you're sketching in watercolor, it's great, but 
but if you're sketching in pencil, I think it has too much of a tooth. So I like something that it's a bit smoother so you can get really fine pencil detail. But for people who sketch exclusively in watercolor, I would definitely recommend um, the moleskin watercolor. So we had a couple questions about the masking, uh, what your favorite way to apply is and what this specific one is. Um, so I can just grab those that you're currently using. Yeah, could you show um, the pen and then also the applicator? Yeah. So Tyler. with any wet media, so whether it's painting with watercolor or whether it's using the markers since they are wet, you can use a release. Um, you can just use tape. This tape along the edge would be a release of sorts. And lately she's been using this liquid release. Uh, this one in particular has a very fine tip. It has a needle tip. Don't be scared. If you can see that, it's a very fine needle tip. And so that applicator just lets you put on exactly where you need that masking fluid. And the reason I enjoy the needle tip is because most of the time when I'm masking, I'm masking out things like bright white whiskers or fur. I don't tend to mask large, large areas. Um, I know some people do. I just, it's not part of my process. So I'm always using the super fine applicator. And so with that, with this one in particular, she's using this drawing gum masking marker. So it's a really innovative way to apply it. It's very convenient, it's just in a marker. So cleanup is a breeze um, and it's great for traveling. Uh, she uses this one a lot when it's just very, very small details because since it has a marker like tip, uh, you can get really small dots, you could do lines um, where with the um, more liquid one, it's a little bit more viscous. And again, just really great for travel. Um, having it in the pen form is just so much more portable. So again, just switching from marker back to paints. Um, in a little bit, I'll I'll grab the colored pencil. And actually, what um what's our time right now, Tyler? We are at. Oh, let's see. Depending on the time, we're I'm gonna, close. Yeah, I might want to switch over to those colored pencils pretty soon. So yeah, the masking, the brand is Pebeo or Pebeo, I'm not sure. It's fantastic, it's awesome. Uh, you can find it on Blick, it's just P-E-B-E-O and it's called Drawing Gum. Um, interesting name, but that's because it's great for all medias, not just wet. You can use this with like charcoal, anything where you're afraid of removing that bright white, where you can easily remove it later. And I'll definitely at least um, remove part of the, the drawing gum so y'all can see how, how that looks once you have that removed. Yeah. And we'll definitely be um, listing off all the materials that Katie uses. Uh, we'll probably post that as a comment at the end of the video. Um, I would yeah. type that now, but we're doing so much Q and A. Um, I think we'll get to that at the end, but I will happily post every single thing that she's using because um, we stand by all of these products. She uses them every day. So we had a question about storage of the best way for that you have found to store your original work. Oh, that's a wonderful question. Um, and whether you do anything to it before you store it. Um, yeah, so there's a couple different ways that I've found to store my work. Um, what we tend to do is always have a um, backing board on hand. I have sizes ranging from eight by 10 inches, which is a very common illustration size for me, um, all the way up to 11 by 17 inches. And then we also have clear bags um, which are acid-free, archival. The backing board goes in the clear bag and then the drawing goes inside the back, or sorry, on top of the backing board inside the clear bag. And that just keeps the artwork nice and pristine um, until it's ready to ship to a client 
four Bs down the road later. Um, and then as well, just for finishing, um, I think Tyler has our spray fixative on hand. Anytime we use a material that might be smudged by hand, um, even colored pencil can be smudged at the end. We use this workable fixative. It's really great for just sealing the drawing um, as a final and it'll make sure your artwork stays pristine. And this one's great. Um, it's um, acid free, it's archival safe. We found this one yellow is the least of the ones that we've tried. Um, it's always terrifying after you've worked so hard on something to spray anything over it. Uh, but with this one, there's no issues. Um, we always recommend when you're using a spray fixative, start away from your drawing and then bring the spray over top of it. Start with the test sheet. Don't just go ahead and put it on the drawing yeah. immediately. Start with a test sheet. Because you sure. don't know whether that nozzle is going to splatter or whatever. We found this one is pretty foolproof. It's always awesome. Um, but always be safe. Start with the test piece. And honestly, if you're doing something like a marker drawing or a watercolor drawing that doesn't have that um, material that's going to move at the end, you really don't need to spray your piece, especially if you're going to immediately frame it. Um, if it's a piece that you're very proud of that you want to be archival, um, you know, frame with a UV, um, with UV glass, just so it doesn't yellow or um, lose that saturation over time. Almost any professional framer that you go to should have a UV glass. Um, it can get pricey. There are gallery glass where if you look at it, you can't even see it's there. It's very pricey, but it does protect the artwork really well. Um, there are definitely some cheaper options that still do an amazing job. If you have a blick near you, we always frame a blick. Uh, we find they consistently impressed us with just how well everything gets done. Um, but any framer that you go to should have some glass options that would provide that protection. For normal storage, we just try and keep it uh, low light. We keep it in a dark room. We do have everything clear bagged. Um, so that really helps. Too. We're coming up on six o'clock. Um, I do want to get to these lanterns just a little bit and also show you the colored pencils. So we had a couple, I'm going to follow up. Uh, this is so much better than a hairspray. If you are in a real pinch, you can spray a hairspray on your piece when you're done with it and that will hold it a bit. Uh, that's definitely not archival, but it's better than nothing, especially if you're working with chalk or charcoal or something like that. Well, and definitely if it's like a sketch, just like something that you're you're proud of, you don't necessarily want to sell, but you do want it to, you know, stand the test of time. Like if you're working for a client, I would definitely recommend either, either an archival spray fixative or a UV glass frame. The wonderful thing about this spray too is it's very inexpensive and it goes a long way. It doesn't yellow, it doesn't cause your paper to bend. Um, it's pretty foolproof. So I think these lanterns have a lot of um, pretty fine detail inside of them. I don't know necessarily that we're going to be able to complete the lanterns, but I at least want to show you guys what the spray fixative looks like in tangent with the um, with the pearlescent colors because it's a really cool combination. So I'm just going to try and finish off part of this lantern. And since we're nearing the end too, um, feel free to keep those questions rolling in. I'll just answer as many questions as possible. And I'll start to pull up some of that masking fluid in areas that we're kind of done in. So this, you're just pulling it up with? This is a kneaded eraser. It's a very soft eraser. Um, sometimes you'll use it for sketching when you want to just like pull up areas and not necessarily erase the entire thing. But I found that they're the best erasers for pulling up um, the masking fluid as well because it doesn't harm the page. Um, it doesn't 
really warp that tooth that the page has to it naturally. If you use a harsher eraser, sometimes it, it really starts to pull up some of the material around it. And because she was using the Blix Studio markers, which are alcohol based, uh, she has no fear this is already all dry, so none of it will smudge. And she's waited a bit between doing this and the watercolors. If in doubt, definitely wait a little bit longer. And you'll notice too, when this comes up, it's not perfect. It's not that super crisp um, line. It's bright white, but that's when I really use the colored pencils if I'm um, working mixed media is just to kind of go in and just really, really crisp up those areas and fix some of those edges. And it also provides the really great shadow effect. But these are, um, again, Faber-Castell polychromo pencils, and they layer fantastically on top of um, mixed media, um, dry watercolor, marker, anything like that. And you can build up layers and layers of colored pencil. I mean, usually a piece like this will probably have two to three layers of paint, and then maybe a layer to a marker, and then like five or six layers of colored pencil. You really build up those layers so you get a nice, rich, vibrant painting. So we have a question about finishing. So something we probably won't be able to get to in this video is um, the actual scanning. We did go over that, uh, how we scan our images. Um, so if you'd like to hear more about that, probably uh, go back in the video and view that. And we won't get to that today, but we had a question about how we prep our work for a client. And it really depends whether we're working for a commercial client, like someone that will use this for a product uh, that will be reproduced later, or whether it's a private commission. Uh, for a private commission, they usually get the original artwork, uh, but we always do a high resolution scan and then we package it very professionally. I always recommend, well, actually this is Tyler's recommendation. Tyler's the, um, the graphic designer and does a lot of the finishing touches, but at least a 400 DPI scan, um, that's uh, DOPS per inch. And that will really create um, something that's not pixelated that you can use to print on, you know, print out as a print for a client or reproduce on t-shirts, other products like that. Um, so scan in pretty high and scan in usually as a PNG instead of a JPEG. And Tyler can talk about the difference there. Yeah, we had a question on whether we do any post-processing and we do a bit. Katie's work really is pretty great off, off the bat. Uh, what we tend to try and fix are the small things that are just the process of however you document your piece. If you photograph your piece and are using that, um, post-processing for us normally is taking out those shadows. If you scan it, it's normally taking out the very small dust or imperfections. Um, and Tyler's referring to dust from the scanner, not dust from the artwork itself. We try not to alter the artwork itself at all. Yeah. This is just imperfections, either the shadow created from the camera or the dust from the scanner. Yeah, even if we have a very professional grade and we follow a strict regimen when using our scanner, uh, but no matter what, you will always have very small particles that you try and just remove so they get something uh, that's really perfect. And we really only do that if you have pure white space where you would notice the tiny dots. Because Katie does mixed media, there are very few instances where you need to actually do anything um, besides just in the white space. Um, after that, we package it all up and we send it on, but we definitely use Photoshop um, quite a bit just to clean everything and to organize our photos we use Lightroom. It's very difficult being a traditional artist in a digital artist world because it is expected that the work is pristine when you deliver it. And so by the end, when we package it up for a client, it is, it is printer ready. They could take that image and print it on any product, blow it up on a banner. Um, it's really important to for, follow those guidelines. For us, at least, and for yeah. the things that Katie makes. Every illustrator has a different groove. Everyone gets into their own process and figures it out. 
uh, but for, for us, we found um, to really scan it and get it as crystal clear as possible. We had quite a few questions about the paper itself, about whether we prep it at all. Um, for this, you really don't need to prep it. When you get the really high quality watercolor paper, it has sizing built into it. And that sizing holds that pigment in place. And I think it's important to mention too, I'm not doing traditional watercolor techniques. I'm really not using a lot of water. Um, so some of that like prepping that might go into a traditional water painting isn't really necessary for the media that I'm using. Um, if you do plan to drench your paper in water, I would definitely look into how to prep for that type of work um, because this paper will buckle, it's not buckle proof. We had a question about what kind of printer we use. Uh, day to day we have an everyday and really all we use for that is um, transfer sketches. When Katie does something small and we need to blow that up. Uh, for our business, we have scanners for that that don't really touch any artwork. For our professional printing needs, we rely on a local printer. Um, and we really recommend that. We have a great relationship with ours. Um, couldn't function without it. They're Belgian here in Athens. They deserve a shout out. Um, and they're great. Reach out to your local printer and see what they can do. Um, very often they can do high resolution scanning, printing, and more for you. We haven't found it necessary to have an in-house printer at this point. And I think depending on how far, um, far past six we're going, um, I might stop on this lantern for now and just show you how the light effects are gonna look in the end. Um, I mean, I could keep working on this piece for hours. I think it was just important to really get that base layer done and illustrate a variety of techniques. Um, we had a question about the tape that we're using, how we're holding to a drafting table. Uh, we're using a drafting tape. This one is really fantastic. Uh, we do often use the blue and you can see that up on her wall. Um, but for this one, the great thing about white drafting tape is it lets you see the drawing more for what it is and not with that blue contrast. This one's also fantastic. It's a very low tack. Uh, you have to be really careful when using a painter's tape because sometimes they can be too tacky and can pull up a bit of that edge off that paper. And trust me, I've done it before. There's nothing worse than spending 12 hours on a drawing, pulling up a masking tape, and then completely ruining an edge because the tape has pulled up the paper. <laughs> Not a good feeling. So at this one, it's very little fear that this one is made for that. Uh, and this one you can get from Blick as well. It's a I, IPG drafting tape. And I'll list that in our materials when we list that in the comments at the end. But it's great, really definitely recommend that. I think too, I'm just gonna go ahead and put an entire wash on this lantern because I really feel free to keep the yeah, questions like coming as well, guys. Um, we love answering them, even if they're duplicate. No question, it's a silly question. They're all awesome. So I'm going to go in with these on fine type paints and I'm really going to illustrate how opaque they can get. Um, before I pull up the paint, I just really want to have that, that shimmer near the candle and the flame. Honestly, fire is some of the hardest, um, it's uh, really super difficult to illustrate just because it does take a lot of layers and it does take a lot of different um, different effects to get it to look realistic. So I don't think I'm gonna be able to get it to that point today, but I think you'll 
you'll have fun seeing how that masking fluid pulls up and just creates a really cool like burst effect. I think it's looking gorgeous, Katie, and we have a lot of common sins. And... Aww, you guys are too sweet. <laughs> All right, so I'm just gonna let that dry for like a minute or two, um, then we'll pull it up. So I'll just work on some other areas of the stag. And I might decide that I wanna switch to colored pencil here for a second to crisp up some of these details. Like I said, I usually don't work with black until the end, um, since we're nearing the end of the live stream at least can kind of go in and decide what are going to be the darkest darks. Any like super um, indented creases, maybe the eyes, parts of the nose, those indents in the mouth. Black is definitely a preference. Some people choose not to touch black at all. Um, I find for illustrations, for what I do at least, it's nice just to have a few touches of it, um, just because you really want that contrast. Since I use barely any water, I think that actually might be dry enough to pull up that masking fluid. All right, so let's see what that looks like. So again, Coming in with that kneaded eraser and pulling up that masking fluid. So she laid down that masking fluid only where she wanted the brightest white to be left behind. I'm not gonna pull up all of the masking fluid, just some of it so you can really see. So there's crisp lines there were made with the masking fluid, and now she'll go in and define that a little bit further just to really crisp up some of the edges. And a piece like this can take such a large variety of time. Um, sometimes they're really, really quick. Sometimes uh, she can spend a couple days on them. For this one, we really wanted to show you guys a lot of processes uh, in an hour time frame. So to complete this piece, might have taken a bit longer typically, but probably another five or six hours to really get it to a point um, where I would be comfortable like sharing it, and then possibly even longer if it was to be like a really fine detailed piece. But I think you know, for an hour time, we got a lot of um, interesting washes down. Um, we got to use a lot of different materials and show off a lot of different techniques. Um, I have some of these little glowy dots around that have the masking fluid. And so in the end, if you pull that up, it kind of creates these like glowing orbs or fireflies. And if you were to have a full background, that contrast would just be that much brighter. But I think, I think maybe we'll leave it at that. Um, like I keep saying, I could keep on going for hours and hours, but just in the interest of time, um, I think that'll be it. I don't know if we have any last minute questions that we didn't get to. Yeah, guys, if you have any last minute questions, please feel free. We would love to keep answering. I think we can also answer them after the fact as well. Um, yeah, we'll keep it up in the comments. So if you have any questions after viewing this, just go and comment and we will do our best to comment. Everyone, like I said, we will list all of our materials that we've used today. Um, she started off with a sketch in her Moleskine sketchbook, which she just used mechanical pencil for. Um, we taped down her Aquarelle watercolor. There's a beautiful sketch. Taped down the Aquarelle watercolor paper with some white drafting uh, tape. And then she does a sketch. Uh, today, did you just do a regular mechanical pencil for that sketch? Just a mechanical pencil. Um, I do have drafting pencils and things like that, but I don't know. I'm pretty simple when it comes to sketching, just a, a 2 b mechanical pencil is what I normally carry. Nice and accessible. Anyone can really tackle in that method. Uh, for this one, she did lay down some masking fluid and with that she did uh, a drawing gum marker 
and then started off with the PH Martin watercolors, right? The yes. be um, really beautiful, vibrant ones. Um, and then quite a bit of time with the Blix Studio brush markers. Yeah, we really got to see those in effect in the antlers. Um, and then after that, a few other materials, um, the Fine Tech Pearlescent paints, some colored pencil, but just lots of fun different media that create different effects depending on which area of the, the drawing you're working on. So. Do you think you'll spend some time on this one longer and post the result? I think I will. I think I'll keep working on this guy and maybe post them later tonight. Um, for those of you interested, I actually am doing a 366 day project. Um, I'm posting a new drawing every day. So I think this will be today's drawing. I think so. I think yeah. that's great. <laughs> but thank you all so much for tuning in. It was really a pleasure to be here with um, like art materials. And yeah, if you have any other questions, leave them in the comments. Otherwise, have a great night. Thank you so much, guys.